Uh, welcome to Athlete Things number six. And today we have Mr. Joe Jordan from the States. How are you doing, sir? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Not a problem, my man. So how's how's everything going at the moment, uh, training-wise, you know, life-wise as well? Yeah, man. Uh, as far as life goes, just same old stuff. Uh, go to work, come home. Uh, as far as training goes, uh, to be quite honest, probably the last two months hadn't been going all that well. Um, yep. But uh, this this block that we're in right now has started to pick up. Things feel really, really good. I just hired Kedrick to be my nutrition coach. Um, I've seen so that. I'm working with yeah, yeah, so I'm working with him, trying to make sure that we have all the bases covered. You know, going into nationals and and ultimately uh, into worlds at Malta. Yeah, yeah, I seen. What was the the biggest thing about hiring Kedrick for you? Was it just? It looked to me from the outside like you had your nutrition quite dialed, but you must have just wanted to make sure all the bases were fully just ticked off. Yeah, man, that's exactly what it was. So uh, when I went to Worlds, I I met Kedrick, talked to him a little bit, and since then he and I had been you know messaging, getting to know one another. Um, he's a really really good good guy, good person to talk to. Um, so just from like a personable standpoint i really really liked him um but while yeah. i was at worlds you know i was sitting there talking to yuki and he and yuki worked together and yuki had nothing but good things to say and after worlds chance and i had been collaborating with one another uh on the nutrition aspect of things um just trying to make sure that the weight was at a good place you know um but ultimately worlds didn't go the way that i wanted it to and that yeah. was because I left a lot of stones unturned, right? And so going forward, um, I was like, no, I'm not gonna do that ever again. Um, and so I sent Kedrick a, uh, a message on Instagram. And I was like, hey, if you have any spots, I'd like to talk to you about working together. And uh, so we sat down, we had a, a Zoom meeting together, went over some stuff. And within five minutes of talking to the man, I was sold. I was like, yes, yeah. like if you'll let me hire you, let's go, let's do this. Um, and so we've only been working together for a little over a week now, but I'm already really pleased with, with everything. That's awesome, man. I think that's the biggest thing, right? Like you want to, you want to go, I guess we can touch on, um, you know, South Africa's performance at some point, but you, you want to go, you want to leave no stone unturned, right? You, you need to, I spoke about chance in the last podcast too. Like he did everything leading into South Africa by the look of it that he could have possibly done. So whether or not, he won, but he wanted to walk off that platform essentially and be like, you know, I did everything and this was the best I could have done. Yeah, so I guess absolutely. You, yeah, it's, a, it's the same kind of thing now. Yeah, absolutely. And and that was the mindset that I had going into Worlds, but it's kind of one of those situations where you don't know what you don't know, right? And so yeah, there, was, there was a lot of things that I was doing that I thought was okay. I thought uh, would ultimately lead me to victory. And in hindsight, they were kind of like the thing that held me back, you know? And so, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. It's just like with everything else in life. Um, sometimes you fail. Sometimes you have to take a step back to see the bigger picture and, and how to respond to it. And, and you, you have to allow yourself to be better the next time that that um, opportunity presents itself. Yeah. Was that mainly from a nutrition standpoint? There, there was a, like, as far as why worlds went the way it did. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, so you you mentioned okay. you hired Kedrick to kind of explore a bit deeper and leave no stone unturned in that aspect. What? But what else did you learn from your South Africa experience? Um, there was a couple of things. So from the nutrition aspect of it, I had an extremely good cut at USBI Nationals in February. So I think I cut about four, four and a half kilos um, going into that meat, just a water cut and a gut manipulation. And so... I had never done anything like that before. And because it went so well and I saw almost no drop off in performance, I got a little cocky and I thought that like, oh wait, I can I can actually do a lot more than this. Mm -hmm. And so I was too heavy going into worlds. And so from the nutrition aspect of it, I needed to have my body weight be a little bit closer so that whenever I did make that water cut, I didn't suffer on meat day. So that was the first thing. Second thing was um, I was using straps on deadlifts quite a lot and about three weeks, two or three weeks before USBI Nats, uh, I tore my hand really bad. And so as a result, we had to use straps because that was the only way I could lift while also simultaneously healing my hand so that when I got to USBI Nats, I could lift and be fine, right? Well, when I did that, again, everything went perfect. There was no drop off in terms of grip or 
uh, anything like that, we hit exactly what we thought we were going to. And so leading into Worlds, I was like, oh, I can do that. It's not a big deal. And to be fair to Chance, Chance is not a fan of straps. And he was telling me like, hey, we shouldn't do this. But he kind of allowed me to, to pick my poison. And ultimately, what the straps did for me was it gave me a false indication of where I was and allowed me to do a lot more because whenever I would use the straps, it would allow me to elongate my arms and put yeah. me in a different starting position. And so then when I get on the platform at Worlds, you know, like deadlift didn't go completely terrible. Uh, I still got golden deadlift and I still PR'd, but I think that had I not used the straps, we would have been in a much better situation. Uh, and then the third big thing for me was the bench that I was using leading into Worlds, the pad, the way that was compared to the Alico was night and day different, right? That Alico is so firm and it's like you're, you're, you're benching on wood, you know, there's not much give to it. And the bench that I was using was a lot more uh, similar to like what you would call like a fat pad or something. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I, it was allowing me to arch in a manner that whenever I got on that Alico rack, I was like, holy shit, like I, what am I doing here? You know? And I ended up losing 15 kilos from nationals to worlds. Right. And so there was just like all, all of these different things that culminated that, uh, when you added all of them up made me have the, the, you know, the worst possible day that I could have outside of maybe like bombing out. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you can see, like, I think it was two, two weeks post, um, world, you had a fucking V2 Alico in your, in your, um, garage gym. Like you ready? like, I was like, this man's yeah, fucking, yeah. He, he is <laughs> not going to fuck up next year. Like he's ready to no. go. No, absolutely not. Uh, wanted to make sure that going into worlds this next year that we're, we're prepared and we're ready for everything. Yeah. I think that's that's the biggest thing right like everything we, we think we're doing everything until we realize what we're not doing and then it's like fuck okay we we don't know until we know like exactly like you said and then and then it's how do i change it how do i go about changing it and what i've got to do to be to be even better than what i already feel like i'm doing is as much as i can yeah absolutely um again like i said earlier it's you don't know what you don't know right and experience yeah. is is the best the best way to grow um and so yeah man it's that's what this is all about you know you have to nothing in life ever goes the exactly the way we plan right nothing's perfect and when when you have these situations arise right the way i look at this situation is as hard as a pill as it was to swallow everything can be a blessing and every opportunity, whether good or bad, is an opportunity to learn and grow from this, right? And so, yeah, I could have I could have came back from Worlds and continued to do these things uh, the way that I had been doing them, but I knew that it was going to ultimately result the same way, right? And so um, I had to take a step back, right? So, like, um, I would say leading into Worlds, you know, I doubled 170 on bench, right? And then when I get home and I buy this Alico bench, hitting 150 for a single feels like death and i'm like holy cow this sucks and then you know not being able to pull volume on deadlifts without the straps because you're not used to it you're not used to that uh, just the grip aspect of it the tearing of the hands like you have to build that tolerance and you have to build that skill yep. it's a skill like holding onto a bar is a skill and so you have to take a step back on deadlifts and realize like okay we have to do it the right way because ultimately that's going to get us further along than where we were yeah, I think Danny's in that same position right now because he just had a a pretty uh, devastating uh, nationals meet here. So we we've taken an approach now where it's like, okay, we we got to leave no stone unturned, right? You don't want to get off that platform and be like, I could have been fucking better if I just did this. And it, in hindsight, like they're only little things, but these little things compound so fucking much sometimes that it can just make the performance the complete opposite to what we expected. Yeah, absolutely. That's perfectly said. Yeah. I guess also touching on how did you feel the external pressure leading into worlds? Like you, you, you talk, your talk, right? Like that's, that's who you are. And it's fucking cool. I love it. Like I'm, I'm kind of the same. Like I'll talk, I, I probably won't leading into worlds because I feel like I haven't even proven my point yet, but, but you had, you had a lot of people talking about you. Right. And it's it essentially was your first, first world. Right. Yeah. And absolutely. a lot of, I mean, sorry, go ahead. And a lot of people just like all these external people, you know, you know, King of the Lifts was talking about you, you're getting shared everywhere. And did, did you feel this pressure build up or did you, did you kind of try and embrace it? 
to be quite honest with you, like there, there was a lot of pressure on me, but I didn't, I didn't feel it like in a negative light. Like I like that pressure, but what I would say is um, like, if you go to USBI Nats, which was in February, a month before that, nobody knew who I was. I, I think I yeah. had like 300, 300 followers on Instagram. Nobody knows who Joe Jordan is. Right. And then I go and I have this meet. And then all of a sudden, exactly like you said, everybody's talking about me. And then as we get closer and closer to worlds, you know, a bunch of podcasts are picking me to win. Uh, some people are saying, oh, it's not going to be close. And so like, yeah, there was a lot of pressure and, and Chance and I had even talked about that right before Worlds because Chance was like, Chance said that nobody expected him to win, right? Like we may have like people close to him, but like the the powerlifting community was like, oh, Keiko's going to win. Keiko's like defending world champion. He's He just beat Chance at nationals. And Chance, was, Chance said that he felt no pressure because like if he goes and he loses, Everybody expected him to lose. There's there's nothing wrong with it, right? But if he goes yeah. and he wins, oh, well, that's a big deal. And then conversely with me, people were expecting me to win. So anything short of winning worlds is going to be considered a failure, right? It, it doesn't yeah. matter that it doesn't matter that this was my first worlds, my first international competition. Uh, competition. Um, I mean, look at a guy like Eddie. Eddie's a veteran, right? Eddie's been to you know probably ten plus worlds. He's got world records on bench and, and all these other things so he's he's been there he's done that he knows what's expected of him and, and how to go about it and you know i'm i'm a baby you know uh, i'm trying to figure this out as i go and so yeah there was pressure but i loved it um i would say though like to be quite honest with you i would prefer to not be picked to win i love being the underdog that's kind of been yeah. my life and and i would prefer people to underestimate underestimate me because it, it kind of lights a fire in me uh and it brings out the best of me um but ultimately i can't you know dictate what people are going to to think or say you know yeah i guess that's like that saying like you know even when you are on top you still got to work like you're not like you you, you got to be the underdog always even even when you're at the top of your game yeah absolutely um and and as far as the like you said talking your talk like yeah dude i i'm gonna talk shit that's what I do. <laughs> um, and, and to be quite honest with you, it's it's not, it never comes from like a negative place. Like I'm not picking one person out and trying to belittle them or lower what yep. they've done. For me, like, and I, and I had to learn this going into worlds because there was a lot of, you know, people that got pissy about it um, and got their, their panties in a wad. What I would say is like in, in America, that's what you do right? You talk shit. If you win, you win. If you lose, you accept it. And you say, Hey, look, I wasn't, I wasn't the best man, but there's, there's no ill will behind anything. And I had to learn that other countries, they don't operate like that, right? Like you have to be nice and say, Hey, everybody's good. Everybody's a winner and, and fuck that. Like, that's not how I, it's not how I work. So, yeah, no, fuck that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, it, it was never, it was never intended. I never was directing anything at people until they made it about them. And when you make it about you, then, okay, now I'm talking to you. Right. Um, and so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll leave it at that. That was, that was my mindset going into worlds. Yeah, no, I liked it. I, I actually loved it. Like I like when people do that, when they're, when they're open to being like that, you know, like letting the competitiveness come out. Cause we are at the end of the day, like we're competing, we're athletes you know, you can do it in any other sport. They they talk their shit. They talk their big game. Like, why can't we do it? You know, fighters do it. Uh, even team sports athletes do it. Like, like, we should we should be able to do it no matter what as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a competition, right? If if we don't want to be competitive and we don't want to have that aspect of lifting, then why don't we just all stay home? We'll lift at home. We'll we'll compete against ourselves and we'll try and be the best versions of ourselves. But ultimately, that's not what this is about. This is a like you're going to worlds to win worlds. Mm. I'm not going for any other reason than to beat your ass. You know, I'm not fucking up, man. I'm not going to PR. I'm not trying to be the, you know, the best Joe that I can be. No, I want to be the best in the world and I want to dominate you. I want you to go home and have to look at your family and your friends and explain to them why you just lost. Right. That didn't work <laughs> out that way. It didn't work out that way this year, but Hey man, that's why, you know, you get a second chance and we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think, um, yeah, fuck, that's good. I like that. I like that, man. I fucking love it. I, should, I get like goosebumps hearing it when other people talk like that because that's how I think as well. Like I'm the exact same. Like I, I have this competitive dog in me where I'm just like, let, like I'm, I'm at war with everyone who I'm going on the platform with. I don't care 
how far above me or how far below me you are. Like you're you're against me, so I don't like you. Absolutely. I'll be I'll be your friend after whatever. Like we can say hello, take a photo, fucking shake hands. But during that that those you know those hours that we're lifting, like nah, you're 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 at war with me. You're my enemy. Yeah. So to add to that, right? Like Yuki is my boy, right? Like I love Yuki. Um, <laughs> he's one of my favorite people, right? Maybe like two or three months out from Worlds, right? He he made a story, and he tagged Chance in it. He tagged me in it. And he was like, oh, I'm, I want to beat Joe at Worlds on bench. And I'm like, listen, as much as I love you, as much as you're my boy, I want to dominate you now. Like, I want to I took it personally. You know? <laughs> and, and obviously afterwards, like, you know, he's my boy. He always will be. Um, but yeah, it doesn't matter who you are. That's the goal is to win. There's the only reason why I do this. It's the other thing too. It's finding little things to take personally to drive your performance in training even better, right? Yeah, the first first time you shared uh, Yuki on your story and you said, oh, Yuki's a dog and, and go take what's yours. I was like, all right, all right, Joe's, Joe's in Yuki's corner. Let's fucking go then. I, I need <laughs> like, I need to work. But that like just seeing just that little story, like it's a little thing, probably no one else noticed it, but I was like, fuck, okay, let's go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yuki and I had been talking leading into nationals and, you know, he was like, hey, man, like mentally, how do you prepare for these? Uh, these meets and um, how do you deal with the expectations and the pressure and I just told him I was like look dude I was like what's gonna happen is gonna happen so worrying about it is not gonna do anything but make you nervous it's gonna stress you out I was like you know what the fuck you are go there and do what you're supposed to do you know and uh, I think that like that's the mindset that I use maybe it doesn't work for everybody but that's the that's the mindset that I I choose to use and um, when I go into the meet, you have to you have to think that you're the best, right? Because if you yep. don't think you're the best, you're setting yourself up for failure. You've already lost, man. You've already lost. If you don't go in with that meaning, winning mindset and that you know you you think you've already won, then you've already lost. If you have any ounce of doubt, like doubt will fucking kill you. It will fuck you up. You can't have any doubt, in my opinion. You need to just be there and you need to be like, I'm gonna fucking win this. And you know, even if even if you know in your head you you you're going in you're going in and you're going to win you you've got it you've accepted that you're going to win and you finish second or third but you you've done everything like you you've done everything right so it it doesn't matter you end up where you end up exactly like you said like you can't change a fucking thing thinking about it don't think about like oh fuck this guy's what if he does this and then this opens this opportunity now fuck that you just you just got to go there and get to think like you're going to win absolutely you have to have that mindset yeah it's big. It's big. I think like we just got off nationals here and obviously there was the big, you know, the 66 kilos here was like the big talk with, with Danny, Yuki and Andrew. And um, that was good. Like Yuki's performance was great. He, he's changed a lot as an athlete. It's probably, I think, you know, communicating with guys like yourself, uh, you know, working with chance, the chance being like such a high level athlete as well, being able to bring him down when he needs to bring him down. You can just you could see his performance as well was was just like, I guess a highlight of how well he's been going. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I mean, when you surround yourself with like-minded individuals and people who have that experience and that knowledge to pull from, it can only make you better, right? Uh, yep. I think that a lot of times we are a result of the people we surround ourselves with, and so yeah, I try and help Yuki, and Yuki has helped me in the past, right? You know, there's been especially right after worlds, there was a moment where I was really struggling with bench for about a month or two. And Yuki just responded to one of my stories and he was like, Hey man, try this. And within two sessions, bench felt great and it started to skyrocket again. And so, uh, yeah. And then obviously chances kind of the leader of the group. Um, he's a phenomenal coach, um, a good friend. And, uh, you know, I think that I put a lot of trust in chance because of uh, who he is and, and what he stands for. Yeah, you have to, right? Like if this is like where I'm I'm at as well. Like if, if you want to be the, the best, like you want to be coached by the best as well, right? Like, you know, it's someone that you can pull knowledge from and talk to about things like that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean now now you've got a prep for Malta as well, right? So that's gonna be happening what around June this coming next year. I mean, like from USVI to South Africa, you had about four months. Has your, have you started mentally preparing for that as well? Is that not for for Malta? I mean, yeah, because he had US, he had USVI, 
I think what February. Yeah. And then and then yeah. you had uh Worlds four months later. So I mean now that we're in November, you've got about seven months, so double the amount of, the amount of time. So that gives you more time to dial in now, right? Have you started thinking that way? When I got off the plane in Dallas from South Africa, I was thinking about Malta. Mm. Well, like it inst- instantly. Right? Like it. My my life revolves around powerlifting. I, I don't do anything else. I don't have any other hobbies. I'm not big into video games. Uh, I don't go out and drink. I, I don't do any of this shit, right? My life is powerlifting and powerlifting only because I have a goal. And I know that like, this is what it's going to take to win, especially after South Africa. Now I know, dude, I was doing a lot. I need to do even more. And so everything that I do throughout the day is, is I'm planning and I'm thinking and I'm envisioning what I'm going to do, what this next session is going to look like. When I get on the platform for my third deadlift attempt at USVI Nats, what is that going to look like? When I'm sitting in the hotel room in Malta, what is that going to look like? What is my preparation going to look like? Like I am so locked in and so zoomed in like that. Yeah, no, I was, I've been thinking about this. Um, I have a hunger and a desire to not just win Malta, right? Like that's, that's the, I would say the short-term goal, but dude, I have big plans in powerlifting and and I want to do things that have never been done as a 66 and, and beyond. So, um, you know, yeah, we're there. So do you have um do you have nationals again in February before Malta? Yeah. So February seventeenth, yeah. uh, I'll go to USVI Nats and uh, compete at nationals there, and then we'll have about another three to four months to prepare for Malta. Yeah. Are you treating that nationals like exactly the same in terms of the intensity you're bringing, like, or are you going to treat nationals as a bit more of like a a side mission to get you to to Malta? No, I, USVI Nats will be as if it's the real thing, right? Yeah. Uh, so for me to get to like last year, it was maybe an eight to 10 hour plane uh, ride. And and so it's not, it's not like completely the same as going across the world to South Africa or to Malta, uh, but it is a bit of a journey. And, uh, you know, if I would assume that if I really wanted to, I could just not even cut and just lift as a 74. Yeah. Uh, like come in at like 70, 71 kilos and I'll, I'm still going to be on the world team. Right. Um, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut, I'm going to be a 66. I'm going to treat it exactly like Malta because all that is, is an opportunity to learn and grow, um, and to get more data to say, okay, look, this went really well, this went really bad. And to fine tune that, uh, that process for the peak and everything else, you know? So no. And then the other thing too, is, Shortly after my nationals, Sheffield's going to happen, right? And there's yeah, some 66s true. lifting at Sheffield, right? And so I want to hit a total at USVI Nats that when they're going into the Sheffield, they're thinking, shit, Joe just hit that. Yeah, I've true. Got to, I've got to push myself, right? I want to set the bar high. Yeah. yeah like, a lot of people ask me that too, right? Like, are, are you doing, like, because we, in Australia, right, we got to qualify, like, fucking, we got to qualify from a local to a state to a national, yeah. and then to get to Worlds. So we got to do, like, three meets before we can get to Worlds. People ask me, like, are you just going to do this this meet to qualify? It's like, fuck no. Like, I'm doing everything in this prep that I can possibly do to learn more about myself to be better for when, the, you know, the big show happens. So every single prep that I do, I'm I'm going, like, balls deep in that prep every time. I don't give a fuck, right? What's yeah, What's absolutely. the point? And doing it. if we're going to step on the platform and we're trying to be the best that we can possibly be like internationally why would we go out and just you know essentially have a training day on the platform i just i'm not going to pay fucking money either for registration fees and flights and whatever to go train in front of people we're, yeah, we're going absolutely. to we're going to learn we're going to get data and we're going to be better everything everything as far as getting ready for a meet the actual meet it, itself all of these things are like little skills right um, you know, and then not only, it's not only just for me, right. Chance is going to get a lot of data on the peak, how I responded to certain things. And that helps him be a better coach. Right. Um, but not, like every single thing is a chance or an opportunity to get better. And why would you squander that? Why would you waste that time? Yeah, exactly. Right. I'm, I'm on the same page with that. Cause I've had a lot of people ask me that. And like, there's, there's differing opinions, especially here. Cause we have to do so many. And I've always said like, no. Nah. We're, we're not, we're not going to go easy. We're going in. Yeah. I think the only, the only 
instance where I could say, okay, maybe like, let's say, let's say hypothetically I had won worlds and I was going to the Sheffield and Sheffield is literally a month after USVI Nats. Okay. Maybe in that instance, I'm going to sandbag so that I can lift it to Sheffield and do what I need to do. But outside of something like that, which is a very rare opportunity, I would say like, you know, show up and do your thing. Yeah. Well, you'd essentially be in your peak, right? If you would, if you were doing that, it'd just be like the, the start of a block, I suppose, leading into the, to the one that matters. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Fuck. Heavy, heavy talks. Uh, also, you so you started as a 74 i think we t- we we haven't touched on that what's the cut like dude you're fucking jacked right at 70 kilos you're you're fucking jacked like you you put like proper 74 kilo dudes to shame at when you're at 70 yeah first of all i appreciate that uh thanks for the love um but yeah so <laughs> i started uh powerlifting in 2018 that was my first meet and i think around that time i probably weighed 72 or 73 and so it was just natural for me to be a 74 and uh shortly after that i hired chance um you know we probably did like five meets as a 74 and then during covid in 2020 you know i hadn't done a meet in a while um no actually take that back this was 2021 so like in november 2021 i hadn't done a meet in a year and a half and i wasn't having fun training or lifting or anything and so i just quit powerlifting altogether and at this point i probably weighed like 76 or 77 and i didn't lift at all for eight months didn't even go to the gym and so i dropped from about 76 kilos down to about 64 kilos and because when i don't work out i'm skinny uh i'm super small and so then i decided okay i'm gonna get back into powerlifting i miss it and so I start lifting again. And then I had just had this thought in my head, like, why don't I just stay down at 66? And, and there was a couple of reasons, right? Number one is Taylor Atwood. Like I was like, I'm never gonna beat that dude. So maybe I'll just stay down as a 66, right? Um, and so, but the caveat was, I was like, hey, I'll get up to about 68, 69 kilos and let's see how strong I can get. If I'm not getting nearly as strong as I was as a 74, then we'll go back up. We'll go back up to 74. So I get there and within like three months, I was already hitting like all the numbers that I was hitting as a 74. And I'm like, well, shit, like let's stay here. Um, And then I think when I first told Chance about that, he was a little leery about it. He was like, "Uh, okay, fine. And then, then I got stronger. Like, then I was like, you know, my best total as a 74 was like 667 and a half. And then when we went to USB, I had to hit 700 as a 66. And um, so, yeah, but to be quite honest with you, though, it is a, it, it is a struggle um, to keep my yeah. weight where it is because it, it would be super easy for me to jump up to like 77 um, without a doubt. Yeah, fucking nice. I think, I think you said you've planned on going up to 74 again eventually as well. Yeah. So there's a couple, there's, I have a mental checklist of things that I need to do um, as a 66. If and when I do those things and I've covered all my bases, I've accomplished all the goals I have as a 66, then I ultimately will go up to 74 and possibly beyond to 83, right? Because I'm 33 years old. So, yeah. um, you know, I want to see, th- there is there is a point in my life where I want to see what is the biggest, strongest Joe that I can create, you know? Um, but I have to take care of these um these goals that i've set for myself as a 66 first i imagine they're quite high as well yeah i guess sheffield's probably on there as well yeah uh yeah i mean i would love to lift it the sheffield that's you know once in a lifetime opportunity that you what yeah 12 men and 12 women are going to get to do this year and so like yeah that's a short list i would love to go to the sheffield i want to um i want to put the 66 kilo world record so high that it's going to take 10 years for anybody to come close to it um and 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 i'm just gonna be honest you know some people may laugh when I, for this. I want to hit a 12 times body weight total right so if i weigh in at 65.7 it's like 790 and some change right like 791 um okay. i know that sounds i know that sounds ridiculous but to be honest with you I don't think I'm that far from something like that, right? I think it's going to take a an extended period of good training. I think I'm capable of that. And I think that like, you know, you may look at my career as a powerlifter and you say, 
well, Joe's lived it for four to five years. There's no way that he's going to go from 700 to 790. And it's like, there's a lot of things to that, right? Mm -hmm. So for the first year of powerlifting, I was coaching myself. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, I, I was not working with chance. And so for the first year, I wasn't doing anything. And then um, after Nationals 2019, I, I was signed up for the Arnold, but I pulled, I, I was going to pull out of the Arnold and I stopped powerlifting for like two months. And then with a month left before the Arnold, I was like, fuck it, I'm going to do it. And so I lost a lot of period there. And then COVID, there was like a year and a half where like training was terrible and, and I wasn't really making any progress and, and I ultimately quit, right? And so like, yeah, I've been powerlifting for five years, but really and truly there's probably been about two years of like good, solid powerlifting training. Probably a year is a 66 and a year is a 74. And then also like there are so many things that I'm understanding as a lifter that I'm like, oh, wow, if I do this, this is actually much better for me. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I want to do that. I want to hit it 12 times body weight total because nobody has ever done that in powerlifting history on the tested side. Nobody's done that. And, and you know, if, if, if I don't get there, I don't get there, but I'm going to sure as hell try. Yeah. Puts you in that spot where, I mean, like, if you have any doubts about it, you know, you're, you're not going to reach it. So there's like the perfect position to put yourself in a underdog story for the next 10 years, like you said. Or well, for however long you start pushing for this goal, you're always going to remain an underdog if you're always aiming for that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I have, to, like, I set these high goals for myself, but I always believe that I can reach them, you know? People on the outside may not believe that. Um, but, no, yeah, you have to have that mentality for sure. Um, and and here's the other thing, too, about powerlifting, right? If you go back five years, the numbers that people were hitting back then and the things that were winning worlds, it's so low compared to what um, people are hitting now, right? Yeah. And then if we, if we talk about 66s in particular, right, if you take – the best 66 deadlifter, in my opinion, in the world, right? I know he's 67 and a half, but Daniel Clements, he pulls over 700 pounds, right? If you look at the best squatter in as a 66, you know, Jonathan Garcia or Charles Opoco, take who, whoever you like better, but both about a 600 pound squatter, right? And then Eddie, you know, he's damn near benched 500 pounds as a 66. We'll bring, let's even bring that down by like 70 pounds, right? 430. Like let's say it's like low fours. When you add all of those things up, you you get that 690 total, or I'm sorry, the 790 total. So as a 66, that thing, that is possible, but you have got to find the right person who is the perfect storm who can encompass all three of those lifters. And when that person finally comes and exists um, and can put all of those things together, it's going to happen one day. It's just a matter of when. Fucking nice, man. I, I believe the, the Taylor Atwood, essentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What that's, was um what was Taylor's times body weight when he did the eight thirty? Eleven point six, eleven point three, some of like that. Yeah, 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 right. It's achievable, man. I, 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 don't, I believe there's, there's definitely fucking things that are going to happen over the next few years that we've never seen. It's happening now, right? Mm. Which the sports just evolving. You know, the pool's bigger, the talent pool's bigger. People, what they're doing, you know, and what. The way that we're also starting to treat ourselves as well, like you touched on earlier, Joe, like you're leaving no stone unturned, right? Uh, I'm, I am the same in most aspects. Like I, I just, everything I do is about powerlifting, right? I don't give a fuck about anything else. Like the thing, like from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, it's powerlifting related. Yeah. And I don't care if that makes me look like a fucking psycho. I'm still, I'm still going to do that. Right. Like, I don't care. That's, this is it. This is my goal. This is what I'm chasing. I don't have time for just about anything else right now. So that's it. Like, especially the next, you know, six or seven months into Malta, this is, that's it. I don't care. I've already set, set that for myself and basically, you know, pull myself around, away from so many situations moving forward. That's just could, you know, adhere to my performance on that day that I just, I'm not going to be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you want to be great, you're going to be misunderstood. People yeah. people who don't have these goals that you have, they don't understand why you do what you do, right? You do. You know why you started down this journey and down this path, um, but you're definitely going to be misunderstood. And the way I look at it is I don't want to be 50 years old, 55 years old, and then, you know, never have achieved what I wanted to. And I look back and I'm like, 
man, if only I had done this, then uh, maybe I would have achieved that goal, right? I, I don't think that failure is the is the thing to be worried about, right? I think it's regret that you didn't do what you wanted to do. You didn't attempt it. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, fucking oath. Re- regret, right? Looking back and, you know, regretting some decisions that you made. Because you, know, you can you can do it. If you do everything and you fail, you've done everything. It just wasn't, I guess, meant to happen. But if you if you look back and you have regret, right, that's going to hit even harder because you know that you didn't fucking do everything. Mm-hmm. You know that you, 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 you didn't treat your nutrition properly you didn't fucking you know you didn't move it around enough you didn't get it get enough movement through the day you didn't take that day as serious you know you kind of just like flustered through a few sessions or a few training blocks or something and you've set yourself up to look back and essentially regret decisions because you you didn't tick off the boxes when it's it all comes down it's our decision right it's our decision to tick these boxes off it's and it's it's not that fucking hard if you're yeah, if you're completely dialed in and it's not hard i don't think it's a lifestyle right you know when you do things the same way over and over again it becomes a habit and then it becomes normal so if you look up at the onset of something if you look at it and you say oh that's hard then you may be you may be scared to go down that path because it looks difficult it looks like oh there's no way i can do that but if you just take one step at a time right you have to take everything one day at a time one session at a time one mill at a time one whatever it is at a time and then ultimately you you string together uh one two three four five sessions like this and now oh wait this wasn't as hard as i thought it was this is this is actually doable and and i think that that's how you ultimately get to the goal that you want yeah it's just yeah. just generating momentum right that's something we that's something we touched upon with chance i mean like he strings upon positive momentum as he's going and trying not to you know, go into a negative spiral as well. And then on top of that, like we were talking about lifestyle and, you know, how he went all in on on just powerlifting when he started. For yourself, you've had like a couple ups ups and downs in your in your four years of powerlifting. Like you've stopped here and there. Were were there certain sacrifices you made within that four year period that got you to finally go all in? I think it was just the realization that I could do something great, you know, as a 74, um, I was not anywhere close to the level as a 74 that I am as a 66. And so, um, I had a little bit, a little bit of success as a 74. Um, but ultimately like I wasn't even top 20 in the U S right. So I was good, but I wasn't great. And then as a 66, you know, I go and and then I hit the 700 kilo total and I see that like, and that was with like, Chance and I had worked together for three months leading into USVI Nats. So it wasn't like this long extended prep. It was just like, bam, here's 700, you know? And, um, and so when I saw that, like, wow, I, I can, I can be great. I can be the best in the world. I can set world records. That was when that mentality finally shifted to, you know, from second gear to third gear. And then to be honest with you, going into worlds, I made a lot of progress. If you go look at the, the stat sheet from worlds, you won't see that. You won't know that you'll think, Oh, Joe got weaker. No, I didn't like all three lists, all three lists progressed. It just wasn't, it wasn't the case where it showed up on the day. Right. So you, you wouldn't see it. And so then knowing what I did wrong, now I shift it from third to fourth year because I know, okay, I can be even better, you know? There's a lot of times in our life where we think, oh, I'm giving 110%. I'm doing the best that I can, but we don't know actually there's more, you know, Uh, the human body and the human mind is capable of so much more than I would say probably 99% of the population will ever push it to. Um, You know, we always have that little voice in the back of our head that tells us, slow down. This is hard. Take a break, whatever. And it's like, no, dude, you can go 190 miles an hour and slam through this wall, like do it. Um, and until you do that, until you have reckless abandon, you don't know that what you can do, you know, Mm. that resonates with me a lot. Definitely. Like when you have that realization that you can do something great or a lot more than what you're currently doing, that like definitely drives even more progress, right? Like same thing kind of happened with me this year, like all end of last year, like all of a sudden 
knocked over the 800 kilo total and all of a sudden I'm like, fuck, I just did 800. Now all of a sudden 850 isn't far away and then 870, 880. So like it just drives so much like mental confidence in your own abilities and then you just keep carrying it and you just layer it over on top of each other um, where you just drive, yeah, even more progress in your training. Like same thing for me, I've had like the last you know, six, eight months since I've had that realization that I'm finally, you know, getting a good stride. I've had some of the best training I've ever had. And part of it and a big part of it was purely just because I've had that realization that fuck, I can be strong. I can hit fucking 900 one day. So we can fucking do anything, man. Yeah. Yes. And, um, that really resonated with me when you just said that, that realization, that, that one moment when you go, Oh fuck. Yeah. I can do this. So yeah, that's, um, that's fucking sick. Yeah, one of the one of the most dangerous weapons you can have is confidence. When yeah. you get that confidence and, and you know. understand, like just like Steven said, you can do anything, right? Mm. You know, um set set these goals for yourself and 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 do not negotiate with yourself, right? If you tell yourself this is what we're gonna do, this is what we've laid before us, don't negotiate with yourself. Don't allow yourself to pull back. You know, you've got to have that intensity. And powerlifting is, you know, still considered a small sport to some extent, right? And so if you look at like a professional athlete in like a more global uh, sport, like soccer or football or baseball, right? Like that's what they do. That's their job. That's their life. Right. And as it, right now, powerlifting for a lot of people is considered a hobby for most mm. people. Right. But that doesn't mean that powerlifting can't be treated the same way that those athletes do. Right. And, and we're starting to see more people are doing that. You know, like Steven said, he wakes up and he starts thinking powerlifting all the way until he goes to bed. And I think we're going to see that shift that like, again, we're just, we're barely touching the surface of what people and what the human body is capable of in terms of powerlifting. Mm. Well, yeah, that was one reason like why we started this podcast, right? And why we wanted to call it athlete things is because we wanted to highlight more of these like 1% little things that powerlifters can do to take it more serious. And that was, that was basically what started this whole idea of this podcast said segment, you know, so we can highlight that people can take it seriously and it can be a bigger part of their lives and not just a hobby. And then yeah. like Steve said before, like more and more people are taking that on and now more and more people are starting to really push the barriers in terms of what you can do with the squat bench and deadlift. And I think now like it's just going to keep fucking snowballing really. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like we've said before, the, the pool is getting bigger. You're starting to see, you know, there's a lot of countries that, are just now getting into powerlifting and they're they're kind of learning these things and and how to how to program how to lift how to recover and as we get more and more people focused on this topic you're going to have better ideas like the way we train today is probably better than the way people were training five years ago but five years from now there's probably going to be more innovation and more things come out that make training even better you know yeah exactly right and then more people fucking actually having a go, right? Just trying harder, do, ticking all the boxes, doing everything right. It's like I said, like, what? why is, you know, these fighters, you know, people that play baseball, soccer, football, everything else, why are they allowed to take things so serious? Which once, it fucking started as a hobby for them, right? Like, they they started growing up, they, they were playing as a hobby, they did it, they came to this realization that they were good, so they pushed it, you know, just because they can earn money from it. We're, we're starting to get there with the Sheffield and everything. So why can't we take it as, just as fucking serious as these guys do? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the way that I think about it anyway. Like if, if you know, they can do that. We're, we're doing a sport, right? Like no matter how, if there is this boxed in hobby side of things and then there's, you know, there's the elite level guys. It's We're only elite because we fucking treat ourselves like we're athletes, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. That's my personal opinion anyway. You know, there's going to be some guys that, you know, can fuck around and they'll still be real good just from some genetics. But, you know, that's sometimes it ain't going to beat the people that are just like ticking all the boxes as well. Right. I mean, genetics will only get you so far and, and eventually you have to have hard work. And, and conversely, hard work will only get you so far and then eventually you're going to have to have some genetics. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you get the person who has the genetics and has the drive with the hard work, that's when you start to see uh, greatness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. By the end of your career as well, you end up leaving a legacy for someone else to change, right? So if if it doesn't end up becoming you, at least you pave the way and you become a trailblazer for someone else. And that's where yeah. we see the evolution of powerlifting over like generations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's exactly what we're doing right now. 
you know, um, when you look at like, you know, take like a, a 600 pound squat as a 74, right? A couple of years ago, that was unheard of. Nobody was squatting over 600 pounds as a 74. And now you're starting to see multiple people. We got one in here right now that are doing this as a 74. And that's like, to me, that's still ridiculous to know that somebody who weighs 74 kilos can put 275 plus kilos on their back and can squat it. Right. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's a story of the, like the first guy that ran the four minute mile um before anybody had done it everybody thought it was impossible and then when somebody finally did it then everybody started to do it you know yeah and and, and it paved the way for a lot of other people to come in and continue to to beat these records and and uh increase upon it yeah well, that's that's how it is right once someone's done something everyone realizes it's actually possible and then they they realize that they can do it they're just kind of fucking holding themselves back yeah. it's like you saying bolt at 100 meters every sport kind of has that one person that's kind of shot through and giving everyone else something to shoot for. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, oh shit, what do we want to touch on next? That was, that was, that was heavy. That's been a big fucking heavy 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> My heart was racing for a little bit and some of that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess like moving forward for you, Joe, you got USVI, Nats again. That'd be it. And then we, we prep for Malta. Is there anything besides all these little things that you're going to change, like mental wise? Like, do you think you'll, like a lot of people are going to talk about you again, right? Because now you, now you are, they're going to go, is Joe going to come back and is he going to do what he did? Is he going to fucking have all this talk, have all this like, like training getting shared around a lot of podcasts, fucking talking about him winning, you know, is Joe going to come back and just essentially like flunk on the world stage? You know, is that going to be the same thing that happens again? Or is he going to come out and do what, everyone expects right so is, is there anything that you're going to change from that are you just going to be like block it out and not listen in a way or are you going to embrace it and you know talk oh. your talk again no i'm not blocking anything out i hope they say it right like i hope that they they expect me to show up and to fuck around again and to, to not do what i'm supposed to do i want them to think that right uh, because I fooled them the first time thinking that I was going to be great and to fool them again, when they think I'm not going to be great and end up being great. Like that would be funny to me. Right. Like, um, <laughs> I want them, I want them to underestimate me. I want them to think that, uh, Joe didn't learn his lesson. Um, but, but I have, right. Uh, and I would say that like my mentality is the same and it just is, is more yeah. of what we've been talking about of the mentality we have as lifters, but I did grow up a little bit and I did mature, um, to an extent. And, uh, and I've learned that like, you don't, you don't always have to, um, in terms of training, for instance, right. For me, I was probably overshooting a lot leading into world. Right. And because I thought like, Oh, if I, if I overshoot and I push, I, I'm going to get strong. But now I understand that like, listen, man, a, a wall is not built by just throwing a bunch of bricks on the ground. You know, you have to lay one brick at a time and then ultimately build that wall over time, right? And and again, Malta is not my ultimate goal. Like that's not that's not the end of the story or the end of the journey, right? It's 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 one chapter. And so I'm going to put these bricks down and build through this chapter so that I set myself up to continue to build beyond that, right? Um so people are going to say what they're going to say. You could you could be the greatest person in the world and you're going to have a hater, right? So like one thing that I, I try and do is, is understand that. And I'm going to do me. If you don't listen, there's going to be a lot of people that love me and cheer for me. And there's going to be a lot of people that hate me regardless. Right. Uh, and I think that that's the case for everybody. So I'm not going to get caught up in it. People can say what they want to say. They can pick me to get first place or last place. I don't care. Uh, they're irrelevant. They're not they're not in my life. Um, and so I'm just going to do me and I'm not going to change for anybody. Good. Good. Oh, it sounded that if they're not, they're not, they're irrelevant, right? They, if they're just like on social media talking shit, that who the fuck are they to you personally? Right. Who cares? Yeah, absolutely. No matters. I guess shit. I think that's, we've touched every base that we can talk on in terms of like being an athlete. Right. Like you, you are, in my opinion, you know, you're someone that's, that's dialed in, you, you tick all the boxes, you do everything right, you talk your shit, you, you are Joe Jordan, you're the only Joe Jordan in powerlifting. And I think, you know, that you, you'll go as far as, as you want to go, right? 
you, you've come to that realization that you're the the only boundary from getting you there is yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, I I have this mentality, and and you know, I am a shit talker, and and all those things. I am an intense person, um, but I think that people who truly know me. I'm also one of the nicest people you'll ever meet and I'll give my shirt off my back for just about anybody, you know? Um, and so, you know, like there's a lot of people who, you know, I'm constantly having people and a lot of times it's the same people DM me on Instagram, asking me questions about powerlifting or asking my advice about this and that and that. And, and I help everybody that comes along uh, because I couldn't be where I'm at if people hadn't helped me. Um, yeah. not, not just with powerlifting, but just in life in general, right. Uh, I would not be where I'm at without the help of others. And so I try and pass that along, um, to people. And I remember like a week or two ago, somebody, I had posted some, something and somebody said, wow, that's, you know, that motivated me a lot. Thank you so much, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, man, uh, no problem. Use it for greatness. And then whenever you get to where you're going, take that and help motivate other people, you know? like Danny alluded to, like we're setting the path for, for people going forward. And so um, if, if, if I could have people understand one thing about me, I am a shit talker um, and, and I have the mentality that I have, but I also want to help people to grow and to be the best versions of themselves as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Man. Paving the way. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that's, that's it there. Um, thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking. Thanks for like letting everyone know, right? How, how you think and how you, how you train and how you, how you are outside of just like moving a fucking barbell around. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. There is a lot more to that. Yeah. I want to say thank you to all of you guys uh, for having me on for, you know, let me be a part of this conversation. I really do appreciate it. Uh, it means the world to me to have the acknowledgement that other people want to hear what I have to say. Um, and, and also I want to say that, that um, from the States, you know, I see what you guys are posting. You guys are putting out a lot of informative uh, things on Instagram. Uh, and, and you guys are literally a part of this process of paving the way for the next generation. So kudos to you guys continue to do what you're doing. Um, and I love to see it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Man. Thank you. Uh, yeah.